Well, hi, good morning. Welcome to my shop. It's the last day of 2017. And uh, since my last video, I've actually not really done anything to this radio, even though I said something about changing out all the cracked wires. Uh, it's just Christmas time, and it's a little tough for me to get in the shop here and get anything done. But I'm in here this morning, and I'm going to take a look at two things. One is I'm going to take a look in this book and look at some information about this particular radio and uh, some other interesting information that, that's in here, by the way. Very interesting stuff. Thank you, my friend Scott, for giving me this book quite a few years ago. And, uh, you know, I sell them in my doing radios out of the 20s. I'm usually working on radios from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, stuff like that. But seldom have I done one out of the 20s. This would be maybe my third or fourth radio, and by far the most difficult, uh, most difficult one. So I'm going to look in this book. I'm going to look at some of the fantastic comments that I got on the last video. And then we'll probably get around to looking at the radio itself, uh, particularly to see if there's one or two key problems that might be in there that some viewers have identified. And uh, beyond that, uh, just just a comment about uh, the wires. You might be wondering once again, how did I make, how, what is this, video number 42? How did I get to video number 42 with a lot of cracked wires inside the radio? But in my mind, uh, what I did early on is check those wires for shorts by simply moving them, wiggling them around, all the ones I saw that looked like they could be shorted including the particular wire going through the hole in the aluminum chassis, which really looks like it should short. The thing to realize is a lot of these wires have the copper conductor and they have the outside black plastic that you see is cracked. But there's another layer of insulation inside a cloth cover that's, that's wound around the conductor. So even if the uh, outside insulation is cracked, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a short circuit. So. That, just in case you're wondering, why has Jim uh, gone so long uh, and not changed those wires? And number two, uh, I, I would never jump into any kind of general uh, restoration of a radio like this without first trying to figure out what is going on with it on two levels. One, you know, how is it supposed to work? What's all the circuitry? Try to get comfortable with it. And two, what might actually be the real problems with it before I start doing general stuff like changing all the capacitors or or in this case changing all the wires for fear of introducing another problem. You know, usually when you're doing repair stuff, you tend to not think of what you're doing as a problem. You tend to think of it as a solution to something. But in fact, if you make some small mistake, and I have to admit, I have made small mistakes now and then, you can actually introduce a problem. It's very hard to get your head back on it afterwards particularly a wiring problem. A wiring problem can lead to such weird behaviors, like, like, like a short-circuited wire too, can lead to such weird behaviors in the radio that you can't sort it out for staring at the schematic because the schematic no longer represents what the radio is actually doing. So I, I'm kind of scared about that kind of stuff. So anyway, let's take a look at this book. This is a great book. Um, should pay homage to the guy who, who, who did it. Here he is. Uh, what's his name? Alan Douglas. And this picture here, he's in his research library. Look at what he's got there. Man. Okay, so this guy is my exact opposite. This guy is Mr. Super Organized. Uh, I'm not quite so organized, I'm afraid. So anyway, thank you for producing this fantastic book, which is full of interesting information, including a little bit on... Bosch, okay, so it's really radio manufacturers is really what this book is about. There we go. It's got lots of uh, advertisements in here and stuff like that. I'm not showing you the whole book. I'm just going to leaf along until I get to some interesting stuff. I guess you can probably freeze the video there if you really want to look at one of these pages a little bit longer, but and we're not going to go through the whole book. That's not what I'm doing. I'm going to go... Uh, <laughs> this guy's got three hands. Probably a comment about radios with three tuning knobs. How can you possibly tune them? Didn't notice that before. Just keep leafing along. Okay, so you see radio receiving sets 1926 to 27. There they are. 
There they are down here. 1928. Now this book is mixed with sales information, sales brochures, all kinds of stuff in here. So you really got to study each of these pages to figure out are you looking at writing by the author or are you looking at a reproduction of some earlier document. Okay, so we're going to start here. Just looking at this uh, a little bit uh, yesterday. Again, I, I've looked at this. I've never really studied it all that thoroughly. These are statistics about the industry. Well, statistical survey of radio business as of January 1st, 1928. So this is not written by the author. Uh, this he, he, He's gotten this out of uh, contemporaneous documents. Would that be the right word? Stuff from 1928. Now, I'm not going to study this chart too close. Radio audience as of January 1st, 1928. Number of people listening to sets in use. Okay, starting in 1922. There's a reason why he's starting. This chart starts in 1922. 75,000. This would probably just be people in the United States. This probably isn't a worldwide book or anything like that. So we'll assume that this is in the United States, but it would be representative of what's happening in other similar countries, certainly here in Canada. You could probably divide that number by 10, <clears throat> 10 or 15 to get what was happening in Canada. So. 22, 23, all the way up to 1928, and you can see the the, the huge rise in here from 75,000 one year to 3 million the next year, 10 million all the way up to 35 million radios. Uh, the population in the United States in 1928, I don't know what it is, but I think by the time you get to 35 million radios, you're getting pretty close to a radio in every household, 1928. That's the year of the radio I'm working on. 1928. Here's a, a more detailed breakdown. We won't go into it. Number of sets on farms. 1927. 1.6 million. It's probably part of that number up there. Okay. Number of dwellings wired and unwired by states. So if we take a state near me, say New York State. Of course, New York State was ahead in the game. Estimated number of homes. Uh, two and a half million. Number wired for electricity, two and a half million. Number unwired, these would be remote farms, 140,000. So you see, 1928, in New York State, just about everybody had electricity in their home. And I don't think that's true in some other states. Let's look for a big number over here. So here we are, Oklahoma, okay, uh, half a million uh, wired. No, half, half a million homes, 175,000 wired, 380 waiting. That could, you know, um, the farther you got away from the New England states, the, the more, uh, I don't want to say backward, but I guess that's the word for it, your state might be. Similar things would be happening in Canada, just with a different distribution. Okay, let's keep going here. These are all the radios that were being sold. Yeah, well, maybe not all of them, but uh, certainly most of them here. It's an interesting chart we'll dwell on for just a minute here. Um, so, if you look across this, okay, first we'll ignore these bars. Look at this, this line here. This is the number of radio set manufacturers. So here we are, 1922. Uh, there's actually no no number on here. 1922, but you can see it's very low. Here it's at 140 manufacturers at the end of 1923. But actually, as a percentage, that's a huge rise. And then it goes up, 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 up. 1926, there's a total of 600 radio manufacturers. So you can imagine the flood of radios coming out of these factories at that point. And then it, it tapers off, way off, way off. So what's happening here is we've got 1928 and 1929 is the crash of the stock market. Although there was a huge pull on radio technology, people really wanted it and they were willing to cast their final pennies towards it to get a radio. Um, the manufacturing industry was probably consolidating rapidly all the way through here. Probably the winners were buying the, the smaller guys up. There's a lot of confusion all through here about who owns what company? Who's making that radio? Why is that name on the front of it? 
that kind of stuff. And we'll see that a little bit with this radio I'm working on. Okay, so we look at the bar chart. Now the bar chart is, oh, let's look over here first. You see this low line here, it goes along and it just kind of tapers off. It never gets very high. This represents the era of parts and homemade receivers. So it, initially, people didn't go to the store and buy radios. 16, 18 year old boys went to the radio parts store, and, and I'm sure men too, and I'm sorry I'm just excluding women. Nothing against women whatsoever, but I'm pretty sure this was a male dominated deal back then. Uh, what wasn't, really? And if you wanted a radio, you had to put it together from parts. So you see, manufacturing really started in 1922. So you, you could go to the store and buy a radio. So what are these, these charts here are number of sets, I'm pretty sure. Oh, There's an interesting writing in here, I'm not going to read it to you. But if you look at these bar charts, and I'm pretty sure it's number of sets, there's two million. It's falling off again. In 1928, look at 1929, it shoots up, but then there's the crash and falls off. The question mark is here because this document was made in 1930, I guess. They don't know what was going to happen in 1931. They certainly didn't know what was going to happen in 2018, and you know what? I don't know either. <laughs> so here's the, one of the most interesting charts down here. So, uh, number of tube manufacturers. Okay, Number of tube manufacturers. It goes from 0 to 140. So you can see this dotted higher line coming along, peaking in 1926 at uh, 120 and then falling off. That's the same as that other chart, isn't it? The solid line here is the number of tubes being sold. And of course it starts out really low in 22. And by the time you get to 1929, the number being sold is 65 million tubes a year. 65 million tubes. It, it just it just makes me pause and think about the rapid change of technology back then, the revolutionary effect because they're going from nothing to something. They're going from no way to have live voices in your house from a radio to having it. It's not like today where we keep seeing little improvements in technology. This was a fantastic leap forward. There's just no other way of looking at it complete revolution for, for humankind. So it's a pretty exciting time when that radio was, was, was made. I don't want to dwell on these too long. There's lots of statistics here you could study, but we won't. So now the way the book works is, is he, he, he kind of goes through the different manufacturers here. We're going to skip ahead. So I'll let you glance at some of the pages. Of radios. There's a distinct look to radios in 1925, 26, 27, 28. Every year they looked a little bit different. Let's face it, they were marketing a product and they had to have it look different. And one of the biggest technical challenges was to get rid of the three tuning knobs that you had to tune each one of these correctly to receive something and to move to the single tuning knob. There's one there. There's one knob, two knobs, three knobs. It was a big, big, big selling point. Let's check out this guy here. Look, he's got his, uh, he's got his, what is, what is it, got his smoking jacket on, he's got his pipe, he's reading the evening news, and he's got his radio going there. $135 for that radio. Yeah, surely to goodness that was not a small amount of money. This one must have been one of the most expensive single things you would buy back then. And bearing in mind, with that many manufacturers making these things, that means there's a lot of engineers who had understood radio technology and were jumping into the game. Uh, a bit of a bad portrayal of, uh, of uh, uh, indigenous people. Largest selling transformers in the world. Size of this factory. There's a number of pictures of factories which. Uh, this is kind of interesting. You can look and see what kind of conditions people were working in. Yeah, I can see back in this picture. You might not be able to. There's there's literally hundreds of people in the back here. 
Look at this beautiful arrangement. Hey, he's got a PC. What's going on? <laughs> Can you see down here how, how factory-ish this is? Look, they have this big overhead drive shaft and then belts coming off it down into all these machines, which is typical of factories back then. Be very poorly lit in there too. Okay, we're gonna work our way. There's a transmitter. We're going to work our oh yeah, look, it's child's play. Yeah, even a kitty can tune in like a veteran. Veteran. See to tune this three three one, you gotta be a monkey with a tail to tune the third one. Again, they're trying to sell the single tuning knob, which is what is on the radio that I've been working on. Yeah, let's get up to Bosch here. Sorry, I gotta kinda leave through. Oh, here we are. Here we are, American Bosch. So, I'm just gonna read a little bit here because it's, uh, I don't think I can uh, just say it off the top of my head uh, properly. So, American Bosch Magneto Corporation. So, Magneto. Okay, American Bosch Magneto Corporation was the outgrowth of a business established by Robert Bosch in Stuttgart, Germany in 1885. So this guy had been manufacturing stuff for quite a while and when radio technology showed up, he thought, hey, that's the ticket. In 1906, Robert Bosch and Otto Heinz organized an American sales agency under the name Robert Bosch New York Incorporated, which in 1912 changed its name to Bosch Magneto Company, or corporation, I guess, maybe that's a corporation. Upon construction of a plant in Springfield, Massachusetts, Bosch and Heinz, being German subjects, returned to Germany at the outbreak of the war. Of course, at the time this, well, I don't know, now, this might be written by this guy. So the war, of course, is referring to the First World War. In 1918, the alien property custodian seized the company's assets and sold them to businessmen who formed the American Bosch Magneto Company in 1919. So he started at the beginning. An American Bosch Magneto Corporation was the outgrowth of a business established by Robert Bosch. Instead of the word outgrowth, they could have said was, was stolen. <laughs> was stolen from a German when he went back to Germany and the war started, and Germany became an enemy of the United States. Is that true? First World War? I think so. So, uh, 19, yeah. So they seized, they seized the assets, sold it to some other guys, but they maintained the name American Bosch Magneto Company, or they maintained the, the name Bosch. Robert Bosch, having formed Robert Bosch AG Stuttgart in 1917, and an American sales agency, Robert Bosch Magneto Company. So they're just repeating what's up here. In 1921, this is after the war, of course, fought a series of lawsuits with American Bosch during the 20s for possession of the Bosch trademark. So he wanted his name back, basically. Finally winning a decision by the Commissioner of Patents in 1929. Now the radio I've got is in 1928. The two companies combined in December 1930 as United American Bosch Corporation. I guess that's the idea is United. United American Bosch Corporation. And while the U.S. company was said to have acquired the German branch, it is a fact that by 1940, three-fourths of the company was owned by or in the name of Swedish people. Swedish people. <laughs> ah, so much for your name traveling all over the place. So I just wanted to read that part there. So it's kind of a mixed up, mixed up uh, or a series of, of uh, corporate events, if you like, business events, world events. And uh, now we're going to take a look at the radio I've got. Just let me, uh, oh, no, we'll take one more. Uh, I'll finish with this book. We'll just flip the page here. Five perfected AC models. Yeah, can never be any better than that. That's, that's the best a radio can ever be. And voila. There's the radio I've been working on. So we'll take a look at this now. 28th of June, 1928, the radio was selling for $132.50. 
later 110, this, this must all be American prices. The RF chassis went into various console models, probably all of these. The 28A, I think that's what I've got. 28A, it's $197. Later they dropped it to 170. Or if you paid 195, you could get the speaker. I've got the speaker. The speaker looks right to me. It's very similar to this one, but it's not identical. Finally, finally in March 1929, the 29D, which must be the next next version of the radio, 225 bucks. I mean, you know, I don't I don't go out and spend 225 dollars without thinking about it today. So there we are. There's the radio. Now, just take a, let's just get this in our heads here. A few details. Three knobs. A station. I think that's how you pronounce that. Plate here. With the window to look in at the uh, dial. And above it is a light. There's the light. The light. The light. Control the light, Jim. There's the light right there. It goes in there. Okay. See the detail here? This uh, scribed gold colored line. It's gold. It's black and white in here, of course. The lid here, the hinged lid. See the kind of the details of how it's shaped right in here. Okay. So now we're going to look at the actual radio cabinet. camera here. This, this might be a little awkward. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll bring the cabinet over. Single your station, three knobs, window. This detail here. If you look at the lid, the lid detail. It's exactly the same as in the photograph. But look what it says on the front. It says Victor. Victor, and I don't know if you can see it in the camera. A little hard for me to do that. That's that, that picture, that classic, I think it's RCA picture of the dog listening to the uh, horn speaker right there. It says clarifier, tuner, volume. doesn't say anything more here, but it says something more inside. Okay, now a little bit of camera effort here. I think I'm going to switch, switch to a different camera. Bear with me. So inside the radio, let's see if this camera's going to focus. Maybe not. Okay, so I'll just I'll just hold it close enough to make it focus. So, caution before installing or operating, read the instructions. <laughs> yeah. So look what it's called: His Master's Voice Limited. And look where it's made. Halifax, Montreal, Toronto, Winnipeg, Calgary, Vancouver. Those are all the major cities in Toronto, in uh, Canada. There's a Canadian-made version of this radio. I believe that's what I'm looking at here. With the serial number on it, 7010. Manufactured under license of Canadian Radio Patents Limited. Don't really know what that is. American Bosch Magneto Corporation. So basically this is a copy manufactured by permission from uh, American Bosch Magneto Corporation. And these are all these patented patenting dates. 24, 28 is the last date on here. So that's the story there. 
this 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 plate, interestingly enough, you go down to the bottom has this comes out and it's just supposed to uh, wind up, I think, hitting the chassis and just make a, a physical contact with the uh, chassis. Maybe to make sure this plate isn't a floating piece of, uh, sorry for the focus, a floating piece of metal in the radio uh, would cause some kind of problem. There's nothing else in here to look at. It's just all wood. There's no, there's no, there's no more writing. Okay. Let me just get away. Put this far away where it cannot get scraped because the cabinet's been redone and it's come out just it's beautiful. It's really, really beautiful. Excuse me, I'm scared to have it in my shop. Now the next thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take a look at um, some comments. Wow, I'm already at half an hour on this video. Well, let's go ahead, we'll do the comments, and we'll see what happens. Let's see what happens. So first of all, once again, thank you all for making these fantastic comments. Uh, many of them are, are uh, technical suggestions, and um, I just, you know what, i got to check and make sure that, yeah, okay, just wanted to make absolutely sure you're seeing the screen here. Technical suggestions and encouragement is pretty much what I get for comments. So just take a look at just a couple of them here. Um, so this one, uh, take a look right at these points. Look at the tuning capacitor. The plates are really close, especially near the shaft at the back. Farthest away, you'll see you've got two areas where there are bent plates and possible shorts. Exclamation, 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 exclamation. You should check this out. Well, you're absolutely right. I should check this out. Thanks. I didn't notice any such thing. Uh, other people have noticed it too. Wow, so, you know, but the plates I've looked at and seen, uh, without looking carefully, sure looked rigid and straight to me. So I, I've never bothered to actually inspect the plates for a short. Great. Now, Ted Fred Miller, Mr. Ted Fred Miller, uh, you must be a real expert in this vintage of radio. I won't read this comment in detail, but basically you're pointing out that there's a lot of concerns about the operation of the 27. And to make it do its job as a detector, things have to be a certain way. You have a certain plate current and a certain uh, um, bias voltage uh, on it. And he's even warning here, hey, don't go sticking a VTVM on the grid and think you're measuring the voltage because, of course, the VTVM will disturb the voltage. Um, comment here. So uh, probably in the next video I will end up doing these things that uh, Ted Fred is suggesting here. So uh, and as, I, as I replied to him I had no notion of any of these technical concerns. So that's fantastic. Thank you very much Mr. Miller. And uh, Happy New Year. This radio has adult onset dementia. Yeah, I'm often worried about the guy standing in this shop here too. Looks like you're on to something. Yeah. Okay, so here again, look look at that wire. That wire is, is cutting into the, or the can is cutting into the grid wire. This might be the case. My early uh, poking around suggested that there was no problem with wires actually grounding out. But no, hey, maybe I was wrong. Uh, stop the video, Jim. You're driving me crazy. Oh, well, yeah, I'm going crazy too. So. Entire radio is a bodge job. Do everything, change everything, just fix all the solder joints. I mean, it may come down to this. But if you've watched lots of my videos, you know I like to do things a step at a time and try to and try to not uh, try to get out of the wave of confusion. <laughs> I'm not very successful at doing that, though. Ride the wave of confusion forward. Da, da, da. Maybe you are on to something finally. <laughs> Uh, you know what, I think that right from the start, right from the start I'm thinking that. So anyway, I want to thank you very much, plates, and this very interesting information. So if you want to read this in detail, just pop back to the video that it goes with, video number 41, 
and you can read uh, Ted Fred's comment here. Um, fantastic. So now I think what we'll try is we'll look at this, these plates and just see if they're shorted and then we'll call it an end on the video because I can hear my guests are up and about upstairs in my house so I gotta go and uh, join them for breakfast and whatnot. So let's take a look at the plates. There's never been a time where I'm tuning this radio and I think there's a short circuit in the plates. If there was, I would have looked for one. But there certainly is a sudden change when you get this radio tuned. Oh, listen. Well, you don't have to be a genius. Thank God you don't have to be a genius. You just have to be really stupidly persistent. Okay, let's get the close-up camera on it and we'll, we'll scan through here. Okay, I guess the autofocus is not on. So, with them all closed, This must be pretty easy to spot if you can see it on a... I can't remember which one it was that was actually specified. Let's look at this end. these are easy to find because what happens look this happens on all radios or can happen on almost any radio the uh, tuning capacitor is usually kind of exposed and people reach in and they grab the radio and grab it like that maybe I did this I don't think so though and when you, you grab you reach in you grab next thing you know you've squeezed the, the plates and that's what's happened here or, you know, it's been banged, or who, who knows how it really happened, but wow, that's... There's no... Let me put the close-up back on, because you can really see that it's short. I think when I close this capacitor, the radio goes dead right at the end, and I just noted it as a curiosity. I really hadn't thought hard about it. This has got to be the cause. So. Yeah, you can you can see the plates moving and everything. Well, that's pretty easy to fix. Oh, wow, that's just pretty springy metal. So I think that problem was only uh, would only be evident right here, and I do recall something funny going on. I thought what was happening was, and I think it is happening. The these uh, tabs here, this this uh, the way the way they uh, okay close up camera <laughs> close up camera. You see they made these plates. Whoops here with these tabs. Each plate has a tab and then you, you probably in some kind of jig you, you, you bend these tabs over and then they're all, I'm assuming they've been soldered together. 
soldered or brazed or something has happened to put them all together to rigidize that's my new word rigidize this uh, and when you when you open this up all the way these contact they, they short the plates out now that's what I thought I was hearing so thank you again for spotting that okay so I think I'm gonna stop the video at this point uh, and uh, get on with uh, dealing with all these wires and stuff like that on the next video hey thanks so much for watching hope you found that interesting Happy New Year.